Good morning, everyone. I know it's been just a couple of hours since you just opened your eyes this morning, but I will ask you to close your eyes again, and we will together take a walk down visual memory lane. Okay, ready? Please close your eyes. And we will imagine we're at Central Park, at the southeast end of the park, by the big gate leading to the zoo. We will walk up north on Park Road, past the tickets office on our right, the main entrance of the zoo on our left, and we will be able to see some parts of the zoo as we walk, and we will reach the Delacorte musical clock. And if we are there on the hour, we will see the beautiful bronze animal figures dancing around the clock. We will continue past the children's zoo and we'll walk under the overpass, take a right at the fork, and we'll end up at the playground hidden behind the trees. Next to the playground, the big rock, one of the famous big rocks of Central Park. And on a beautiful day, there will be children playing at the playground and climbing up and down the big rock maybe taking a short break at the treehouse on top. And this time of the year, the trees are all green with their leaves, the grass is green, dotted with busy squirrels here and there. And we'll continue walking up north, past 72nd Street, and on the path down the hill, we'll arrive at the conservatory water, where we will see the model boats sailing. Okay, you may open your eyes now. So I gave you the contents to follow this walk, just using sound and language, which is another great skill of the human brain. But what made it possible for us to take this walk together? Even those of you who are not familiar with Central Park or those parts of the park that I talked about, and even for those of you who did not close your eyes the whole time, you were able to follow and we were able to walk together thanks to our visual system. The visual system makes a complete, flawless snapshot of the whole world around us. And it continuously updates the snapshot to check for any changes happening around the environment. And it relays this information to the learning and memory networks of our brain, integrated with our visual system. And it does it just starting with light. Light reflected off the surface of objects falling to the back of our eyes, to our retina, and then getting converted to electrical signals, which are transmitted all the way to the back of our heads, to the primary visual cortex. Light reaches the neurons at the back of our brains, and... Ooh, my brain's not showing up. But <laughs> imagine that there is actually, this is the back of our head, and the neurons at the back of our heads are putting things together, just lines, bars, and orientations of these bars, from edges to color, texture, and segments of objects, and finally, an object, a lamp, and not just a lamp, but a lamp spatially located on a table in a room. And the part that is at the bottom of our heads, our ventral temporal cortex is specialized in object recognition. And out of all the objects that our visual system has to process day in and out, there is one specific class of visual stimulus that is very important for our daily interactions. And that is a human face. We recognize people by their faces. We can identify who they are from their faces. We can tell how they're feeling from their faces, whether they're having a good day or not feeling that great. And we can also infer their intentions from where they're looking at, from where they're gazing. And reflecting the importance of faces in our daily lives, our brains have multiple locations that show higher activation in response to faces. So these regions that you see as the orange dots. 
And for me, for example, these two particular faces will be activating much more specialized and more spread integrated areas of my brain. They will also cause activations in my memory centers and also emotion centers. Who do you think these faces could belong to? Anyone? Exactly. These are my parents. These are faces that I am very familiar with. I have many memories about these faces, and I also have strong emotions for these faces. And it's the same thing for each of you, for your parents, for your siblings, for your friends, for people that you're familiar with, that people that you recognize, you also will have higher activations in your visual cortex when you see those faces. Um, in some rare cases, when people have damage to their brain in that pink-shaded area, which is overlapping a few areas of the um, face-responsive network, people will become face-blind, meaning they will not be able to recognize familiar faces anymore, and they will not be able to learn and remember new faces. Imagine how devastating it would be for me to look at these faces, just see that these are faces of people, but not know that they're my parents. And this condition is called prosopagnosia, prosopagnosia from Greek, meaning not knowing faces. And indeed, this is a problem of not knowing. It's not a problem of not seeing, because the eyes and the early visual areas of these patients are intact. They can see that these are faces. In fact, patients would report that they can see the eyes, they can see the nose and the mouth clearly, but these features somehow do not add up for the patient to know whose face that is. Now, what in a face is helpful and informative for us to know who that person is? We'll do a quick test together. What part of a face is giving us information? So if we cover up the features of a face, we can still make up that this is actually a human face from the contours, but we can't really tell whose face that is. But trust me, this is a face, although you may not have seen in real life, this is a face that you're familiar with. If we expose the mouth, is it very helpful for anyone to tell who that could be? Oh, you get guesses. Kim Kardashian. Not bad, okay. How about the nose? Anyone? All right. Wow, that is a super face recognizer over there. Okay, how about this? Now, it should be quite obvious to all of you that this face is Rihanna's face. So except for a few super recognizers, actually, it is the eyes that give us the most information to know whose face that is. And indeed, actually, half a century ago, Yarbus' studies show that when people are observing faces, they look mostly at the eyes of the faces. Here on the right, you can see the black track. Oh, it's the, their gaze overlaid on the image, and the darkest parts on that image are the eyes. In the lab, we can start with two faces and take the most informative eye region part of one face that's in that rectangle and merge it with the face on the left. And we'll end up with two new faces. So it's not as easy as it would be in real life, but I guess we can all make out that these two are different faces, and the difference between the two faces are the eyes. Do you agree? Okay. But when you ask face-blind people with damage to the face-responsive areas in their brain, shown in the pink-shaded area, they will not be able to tell you that these faces are different. And even the ones that can tell that the faces are different, they won't know that it's the eyes that are different between these two faces. So, is it the eyes? Is it the eye region, the distance between the two eyes, the whole eyebrows coming together? Is this the part, this image, that our visual system stamps as, okay, 
the relationship of this part, the I region. This looks like phase X. I'm going to stamp it as phase X, and I'm going to relay it to the learning and memory centers to put it on the folder of other information with person X. Is that how it's happening? And where exactly in the visual system, where exactly in those integrated areas from seeing to knowing is translated? Is it the areas that are under that pink shade, the areas that are not activated and face blind people anymore? Or is it the connections of these areas to further network areas downstream? And not just faces, for all the other things, all the other visual information that we see all the time. How is it that our brain, our visual system, binding together all this information, that it starts just from bits, from just light, and just gives us a whole flawless picture of the world? And not only that, we're also able to take a trip together, even when we don't have the visual image in front of our eyes. We have lots of data, we have many theories, and we have bits and pieces of it, but we don't exactly know how the brain is doing it. We've come a long way for non-invasive human studies, so the picture on the left, it's an earlier example of computer tomography, and you can actually barely make out where the brain is over there. And on the right, you see a recent 7 Tesla intensity magnetic resonance image, non-invasive, taken of a human. But we still need further breakthroughs in physics to increase this resolution, and we also need comprehensive computational models to put together the information from non-invasive human studies and from animal studies to have a better picture of how our brain is doing it. And maybe, one of the scientists, future scientists among you, will be able to come with this breakthrough and will help answer these questions. Thank you.